Good morning. And, and welcome. It's good to see you here. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll get going into the service this morning. Happy Thanksgiving. It's the week of Thanksgiving. So I thought that would be appropriate. It seems early, right? How many of you already listen to Christmas music on the radio and stuff? Yeah, me too. There's a lot of people who love Christmas music. I always thought that was weird before Thanksgiving, but I kind of like it. So there we go. But Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for everyone who's here, who's coming in, and I pray that you would be glorified this morning. Father, I pray for church members who are traveling uh, over this holiday weekend and, and, and going to see loved ones. Uh, I pray for all the gatherings in people's homes, that they would be special, they would be meaningful, that we would be thankful. Uh, Father, it seems like a difficult time to be thankful for. There's a lot in the world that doesn't seem to be going right. There's a lot of things that uh, we're concerned about. The, the looting, the rioting that we've seen in the streets, the election concerns, and it seems like nothing's ever settled, nothing's ever done. And Father, we, we look at just things, the corruption in our society, and we look at the fact that we're, many people are locked in, to shut down again. Businesses are suffering. Small businesses are suffering greatly. People are unemployed. And yet, we can be thankful. We can be thankful for who you are in the midst of us, in the midst of this, that you are there with us in the midst of this, that the cross is still true, and what was accomplished on the cross is still true in the midst of everything that's taking place. So we ask that we would focus upon you this morning, and that you be glorified in your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Good to see you all. Let's uh, either stand, sit, um, close your eyes. I'm just going to invite you guys to do whatever you'd like this morning. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to make you do the way uh, that's supposed to be worship. So whatever you feel uh, is your comfortable position of worship this morning. I invite you to do that. Uh, and I know there's. Uh, new restrictions and new guidelines for, uh, for worship today, so we have that on the screen for you as well. Um, but let's just close our eyes as we enter in the presence of the Lord today. Mm. Just reflect on His goodness and His grace oh. this morning.
children, you guys are all now dismissed for Kids Church as well. Thanks. Good morning. And welcome. We are taking a break in our series on 1 Thessalonians to look at Psalm 136 today and, and think about Thanksgiving. Uh, I actually would like to read from Psalm 136, and if you have Bibles and you want to turn there with me, feel free to do that. You'll notice a, a refrain, kind of a, a section. After every statement, there's this statement, um, his love endures forever, his love endures forever. It's, it's repeated throughout the passage. 
Um, the NLT says his faithful love endures forever. And the word that's translated is kessed. Uh, and it's, it's talking about an enduring love. It's talking about his mercy and his, his grace and a lot of things tied up in this idea that it's, he's faithful in his love that endures throughout all time. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, guess what I'm going to say next? His love endures forever. The sun and the, the moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness. His love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings. His love endures forever. And killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. Inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. He remembered us in our lowest state. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. So what do you think that we're supposed to get from that passage? Okay, so, so the main point is already gotten even before we look at the text, which is wonderful. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for the truth of your word, and I thank you that your love endures forever. And Father, we need to know that. I know the nation of Israel went through some horrible times for 430 years, and that they, they said through it all, your faithful love endured through it all. And when we look at our culture and things that are taking place in our own lives and the lives of people around us, your faithful love endures forever. Father, it's a difficult time for our nation. We need repentance. We need revival. We need hope. We need encouragement. We need healing, and not just from the virus. We need you, Lord. That's what we really need. And we are thankful that your faithful love endures forever. Now, you've called us to be thankful. You say it's your, your will for us in Christ Jesus is that we'd be thankful in all circumstances, even during an epidemic or pandemic, and even during the things that are taking place politically in our culture, and even when it seems like there are people trying to control our every move. Through it all, your faithful love endures forever. I pray, Father, that, that you would keep us united through this all. We know that, that people have different opinions about different things that are happening in our culture. But what we are united in is that your faithful love endures forever. Let us focus upon you afresh even this week and give thanks to the one who is worthy of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, I officiated a wedding that was an absolute nightmare. It was one of my worst remembrances, actually, as a pastor. I remember I took the wedding as a favor to my senior pastor, who was an associate pastor at the time, who had agreed to perform the ceremony, but then got into a scheduling conflict. I think the scheduling conflict was the problem that the couple was going to cause, and he knew it. The couple who we knew would be difficult to deal with because of past experiences and because of reputation did not disappoint. They were demanding and they were inconsiderate. The groom was especially rude. 
confrontational, and he only backed down when I reminded him from time to time. It's like, you know, there are other pastors that can do this. There are other churches that can do this ceremony. We don't have to do it. And then he would back down. He just was unrealistic about everything and upset about everything and demanding about everything. Well, the big day finally arrived, and they did not heed the rule that there was to be no alcohol on the premises. In fact, all the groomsmen were drunk at the wedding and repeatedly drank in the church despite being asked not to. They even handed empty liquor bottles to the church's wedding coordinator for her to throw away. No, I'm not talking a beer bottle or two. You know, I wouldn't be going out of, you know, I'm not trying to be prudish about this. We're talking hard alcohol. Uh, Do you know how hard it is? And we did a wedding rehearsal the night before to take a bunch of inebriated groomsmen and bridesmaids and, and get them to walk straight down an aisle and do what they're supposed to do. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. It was like herding cats and trying. And I remember being up, and I was like, when it was finally, everybody was up, and they were in their place, and look, I was just frantic at that point, trying to get things ready. And the bride's coming down the aisle, and I'm thinking, what could go, go wrong now, right? Everybody's in their place. Bride's coming down the aisle. Guests are seated. You know, we'll get through this. The reception somewhere else, and then I can just go on with my life. The bride comes down, and she was supposed to stop at the front of the aisle, and there's a photographer, and we talk about this with everything, with everybody. The photographer to ask, can I take a picture and have her stop? And we put it into the, the, the rehearsal, everything else, that she was supposed to do it, no one else was supposed to do every, anything, stay in their places. When she stopped, and the photographer went to take her picture, mass chaos ensued. The grooms and the bridesmaids all, and they were taking pictures, and people in the congregation that were there were taking pictures, and the grooms would start doing antics, you know. I think when the groom, groomsmen do antics, it's kind of, kind of cute, you know, like the rings and the jacker, cra- uh, cracker jack box, whatever. It wasn't those kind of antics. Everything was extremely inappropriate. It took me several minutes to get them together, and in that moment, I almost did something I've never done before. I almost just walked out. I almost said, I guess we're not doing this wedding today. I got really, really, really close to doing that. Now, I take weddings seriously, and I put a lot of effort into them. Thus, when we pulled off the ceremony with absolutely no help from them, I didn't expect a thank you, but it would have been nice. Instead, they left the church an absolute mess that I had to clean up. Just just left trash everywhere. They destroyed items in the church that I had to explain, and someone in the wedding party, when they left, I guess I thought it'd be a lot of fun, pulled the fire alarm because they thought that would just be a blast. Not only did they not say thank you, which probably was a good idea because I wasn't real happy at that moment, They didn't even acknowledge my existence before they left. I remember feeling used, abused, and taken for granted. Have you ever felt used and abused and taken for granted? We've all felt that, right? At some point, at some time. Later, as I reflected on the scenario and I was was thinking about it, meditating on it, I couldn't help but to think that sometimes I treat God the exact same way. Rather than giving him thanks for the many blessings of my life, I often demand of him and expect him to perform and even fix my messes. If he comes through with a request, I'm likely to hardly acknowledge him or give him thanks. In his commentary on Colossians, Warren Warren Wearsby told about a ministerial student named Edward Spencer in Evanston, Illinois, who was part of a life-saving squad. In 1860, a ship went aground on the shore of Lake Michigan near Evanston, and Edward Spencer waited again and again into frigid waters to rescue 17 passengers. In the process, his health was permanently damaged. Some years later, at his funeral, which probably a bit earlier than it could have been because of the damage that was done to his body, it was noted that not one of the people he rescued ever thanked him. Can you imagine rescuing someone at great personal cost and they never even thank you? Well, Jesus rescued us at great personal cost. Let's make sure that we're stop and giving him thanks. Do we take God's many blessings for granted? And I'll be honest, I often do. I often assume I deserve a home, plenty of water, plenty of food, to be in relatively good health. I too often act act like he owes me, and I take his loving kindness for granted. And in so doing, I take the cross for granted. If we take God's many blessings for granted, does he feel used and abused by his people? So this week, we're to celebrate Thanksgiving, the holiday devoted to giving thanks to God. But why should we give thanks? 
After all, this has been a banner year, hasn't it? Should we be thankful for 2020? Should we be thankful in the midst of a pandemic? Should we be thankful with all the craziness in our culture? So the question is, why should we be thankful? You know, there are two major objections that I have used and I have heard be used referring to why we should not give thanks, objections to giving thanks. And the passage I'll be referring to back and forth is Psalm 136, which I read from a little bit earlier. Now, objection to giving thanks, number one, is look at what I do not have. Really, we're really good at comparing ourselves to other people. And so we compare ourselves to other people, well, they've got this and they've got that, and this is going on in their life, and how come I don't have that? And because I don't have that, I'm not thankful. And one of the things I've always found interesting is ministry. Is I've done many trips to Mexico. And those trips to Mexico, I took a lot of students to Mexico, probably 10 or so youth groups over the years to Mexico. And we go into these places that have absolutely nothing. And parents always liked when the students came back because they tell me, you know, they come back and they're thankful because they realize what they have because these other people have absolutely nothing. And I've always struggled with that a little bit. We're thankful that we're not them. We're thankful that we have more than them. We're thankful that someone else is worse off than us. And I always wonder about that. You know, they tell me, that's, and I understand it's good for them to realize what they have, but to those people in Mexico, they have nothing to be thankful for? Should they not be thankful to God? It's kind of an attitude reflection. Irma Bombeck, in her October 1992 article in the woman's magazine, Red Book, how many ladies remember Red Book? Okay, I don't know, is it still out? I don't, yeah, I don't think so either. Anyways, Irma Bombeck wrote, an estimated 1.5 million people are living today after bouts with breast cancer. Now, that was 1992, so I imagine 1.5 million has changed, probably higher. And she wrote, every time I forget to feel gra- uh, grateful to be among them, to be a survivor, I hear the voice of an eight-year-old named Christina who had cancer of the nervous system. When asked what she wanted for her birthday, she thought long and hard and finally said, I don't know. I have two sticker books and a Cabbage Patch doll. I have everything. That is a good attitude. I wish my attitude were more often like that. So I'd like to make two observations about my unwillingness to give thanks. First, God has provided a lot, everything I truly need. There's a lot to be thankful for. I really have everything. In Christ Jesus, I have it all. Now, Psalm 136, verse 4 to 9, I'm going to read that section again. We're putting it up in the New Living Translation. The reason I want to do that, in verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, it it, it starts with give thanks uh, in the text, and then in verses 4, 5, and 6, most translations don't have give thanks because it's not in the text. But I think the intention of the text is to carry over the give thanks. And so the New Living Translation does that, so that's, that's why I'm using it. It says, give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. And again, every time you hear faithful love throughout this, the word is kessed throughout the passage for faithful love. It's an unfailing love, a loyal love, a devotion, a kindness, a mercy, where we can count on God. It will never, ever fail. It endures. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully, didn't he? Why does it have to be beautiful? His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love, his chesed, endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. And then in verse 25, toward the end, he says, he gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. We'll talk about verses 10 to 24 a little bit later. But here we see the psalmist thanking God because of everything that he's given in creation due to his faithful love. His faithful love has given us a beautiful creation. He's given his creation all it needs to be sustained. He has done this skillfully, and he has done it beautifully. We live in a beautiful part of the country. We live in a beautiful country. We live on a beautiful planet. We should be thankful. Now, there's much in the created order that I take for granted. And if I take it for granted, then I expect I'm not thankful for it. Professor of philosophy and author Philip Weeb wrote, 
We may acknowledge our divine provider over the roast and mashed potatoes, but how often are we deliberately thankful for the water from our taps? You ever think about that? Turn on the water, water flows. You ever been in a situation where water doesn't flow? I know someone here, a couple, yeah, <laughs> where water isn't flowing, and, and tell you what, it makes you thankful for, for water coming from the taps. The wood for our houses and our furniture, the paper for our books and napkins and notepads, the brick and metal and fabric and countless other materials we use and enjoy. God, through nature, made them all possible. We would do well to remember. God has provided well. He is a great provider. The second observation, really about my own life, is that I'm exceedingly self-centered to not acknowledge God's provision. My problem is that I can be narcissistic. I can become very narrow-focused, and it's about me, 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 me. And when my sin of selfishness arises, I really have a hard time seeing reasons to be thankful because I only think of more that I need, more that I want. When it comes to my expectations of God, I can be amazingly selfish and demanding especially in light of others in the world who have so little, and even this is very selfish. I'm thankful not to be them. I'm actually rejoicing in their misery, like I said earlier. It's kind of like you know, that, that thing, of, well, things could always be worse. Look at these people over here. Look how bad they are. So you should be happy. And I wonder about that. I really do, because, again, what do they have to be thankful for? And so we go to this least common denominator. I've got to ask you, on Thanksgiving... What is it in all creation that you do not want to be? Think about that. What is it in all creation you would not want to be? Would you put that cartoon up? I have a couple cartoons here. Um, and so if you, if you put up that, uh, there we go. So here's a cartoon. I see you surrounded by family. Well, not your family. And how about the next cartoon? I love this one. So you got a blind farmer, and he's ready to get his Thanksgiving meal. And, of course, all the turkeys are moo, moo, moo. So, yeah, things could be worse. <laughs> I don't really like to, the, the idea of being thankful not to be them. I don't really like that attitude. It doesn't feel Christ-like to me. It's rejoicing in someone else being worse off. What is a Christ-like attitude? Did Jesus do that? He entered into our pain. Matter of fact, he went to cross, the cross on our behalf. He said, I'll take it on so that you don't have to. The famous Bible scholar Matthew Henry was once mugged and robbed of his wallet. Now, in the quote, he's going to call it a purse because in the time and the place, that was what they called it. But he wrote these words in his diary. And I love that it's in his diary because it means that when he wrote it, he didn't know people would be seeing it. This is really how he felt. He said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. I like that line. I don't have much anyway. Isn't that great? And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not someone else. I think that's a Christ-like attitude. Objection number one, what I don't have is solved when I look at what God has provided and I seek a Christ-like attitude towards others. You want to know something? It's okay if people have things I don't. It's okay if someone has more than me. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 8, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others about, above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So objection number one, look at what I don't have. Look at these people who have more than me is solved with a Christ-like attitude, a Christ-like mindset in which I'm thankful for what God has provided and I'm okay with somebody having more. Well, objection number two, I think, is harder. There's so much death and suffering in the world. There's evil in the world. How does a loving God allow this? How many of you have thought that before? How many of you have heard that thought before? It's out there, right? Indeed, there is too much death and suffering in the world. 
And you may be experiencing the results of this personally. And I don't make light of this. We've lost, I've lost many people personally. And it, it's funny when it becomes personal, funny in the strange sense, that it, it, we feel it stronger, even though we can read about the deaths of millions of people in, in a genocide, and we realize that's horrible. And we acknowledge that's a horrible thing. The evil in the world is terrible, but when we're affected personally, then it really hits home. I remember early on in ministry, a young man named Pete, who had become a good friend, who came down with Hodgkin's lymphoma, had a great attitude, died at a very early age, in his early 20s. I remember sitting there thinking, God, that's not right. A lot of people die of cancer. I remember Troy, a four-year-old in Green Bay, who his mother was in a car accident, and the church was praying for him, and he never got out of his coma. He died after about a month, and I remember, God, that's not right. You know what? I think God agrees. I don't think he's the problem. I think he's the solution. Many years ago, a godly man and his family were simply crossing the street in downtown Denver. His family was known for their devotion to others, their, their generosity, their service, their faith, and a drunk driver didn't even see them and never slowed down. He hit this entire family crossing the street and killed this man's wife, his two-year-old, and his four-year-old. Only this man was left alive. And this made big news in Denver at the time. And many asked, where is God in that? Where is God when those things happen? And the vast majority of Psalm 136, verses 10 to 24, won't read them again, but you can look them up. They speak of deliverance from Israel's enemies. It speaks of their deliverance from years of suffering and oppression. They were suffered greatly. The Jews have suffered greatly throughout the years, and those are his people. In verse 23, it said, To the one who remembered us in our lowest state, his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness, his love has not disappeared because bad things happen. He remembers us. He walks with us through it. In verse 24, it said, And freed us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. His enemies, or their enemies, for Israel, was 430 years of slavery in Egypt. 430 years. It's a lot of generations living and dying without seeing the answer to their prayers. So the Israelites had problems in their history, and we know that, severe problems. They had enemies. They still have enemies. And they were in slavery to Egypt for 430 years, and for 430 years it appeared that God was silent. So what is expressed in this psalm is not a shallow answer or empty words. It's acknowledging the pain of suffering that exists in the human condition. There is too much death. There is too much suffering in the world. God would agree, and that's why Jesus entered into it and died on the cross. He is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Death is the problem. Jesus is the victor. We should be thankful that he gave us victory. He suffered to free us from our enemies of sin, death, and Satan, the ultimate expression of God's faithful love enduring forever. In Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 8, prophet Isaiah writes, Surely, talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus, even in the Old Testament, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Well, that's not fair. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's not fair either. Fair either. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's not fair either. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. In verse 9 and 10, it says, He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, he was innocent. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Notice the pain and suffering Messiah Jesus had to endure. This is truly not fair as he suffered for others and was guilty of absolutely nothing. You want to be thankful for something today, be thankful that he did that willingly, 
Be thankful that he saw us in our estate and said, I will take their place. That's something to be thankful for. Be thankful for the cross, the ultimate expression of his faithful love enduring forever. You know, the world can strip a lot of things away from us. The evil in the world can strip a lot of things away from us, but it can never nullify the cross. God has experienced, have you ever thought about that? He's experienced the consequences of sin. He never sinned, but he experienced the consequences at the cross. He experienced death. He experienced Satan's activity. He understands our suffering and cared enough to enter into it. He did not remove it, but actually joined into it with us. And he did this not just so that we know that he understands, but to give us victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 to 57, it says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Why do we give thanks to God? He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as God delivered Israel from its enemies, so he's delivered us from our enemies of sin, death, and Satan. They are defeated enemies, but not yet destroyed. But someday soon, they will be vanquished. And when we remember this truth, even in the face of disappointment, even in the face of suffering, even in 2020, we will love our deliverer rather than blame him for the problem, because he is not the problem. He is the solution and it cost him greatly. So keep our, your eyes on the cross. Let's keep our eyes on the cross. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus through whatever we go through because then we will see his faithful love endures forever. To get a better understanding of his presence and worth even during trial and suffering, I want to look briefly at the history of Thanksgiving and how it became a national holiday. Interesting. People suffered greatly who gave thanks. Ron Lee Davis tells what the pilgrims experienced before the first Thanksgiving. He wrote, The pilgrims would not fully understand in their lifetime the reason for the suffering that beset them. The first official Thanksgiving Day occurred as a unique holy day in 1623. In the fall of that year, with the lingering memories of the difficult, terrible winter they had just been through a few months before, in which scores and scores of babies and children and young people and adults had starved to death, That's pretty bad. And many of the pilgrims had gotten to the point where they were even ready to go back to England. They had climbed into a ship and were in that harbor heading back to England, ready to give up. It was only as they saw another ship coming the other way, and on that ship was a Frenchman named Delaware. And he came with some medical supplies and some food that they had enough hope to go back and try to live in the midst of those adverse conditions. The people who died of starvation were not statistics to them. They were their children and their spouses and their parents and their friends. Keeping that in mind, listen to the proclamation given by William Bradford, governor of the Plymouth Colony. He said, inasmuch as the great father has given us this year an abundant abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, beans, squashes, and garden vegetables, it has made the forest to abound with game, and the sea with fish and clams, and inasmuch as he has protected us from the ravages of the savages, I guess they weren't politically correct, has spared us from pestilence and disease, he granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that ye, all ye pilgrims, I like the word ye, with your wives and little ones, do gather at ye meeting house on ye hill between the hours of 9 and 12 in the daytime on Thursday, November 29th, of the year of our Lord, 1,623, and the third year since ye pilgrims landed on ye pilgrim rock, there to listen to ye, pastor, and render thanksgiving to ye almighty God for all his blessings. I find that remarkable. Yes, they finally had a good year. (laughs) But the previous two years were horrible. These people knew God and held on to the truth of his deliverance and acknowledged him as opposed to blaming him or taking him for granted. Yet Thanksgiving did not become a national holiday until years later. It was decreed a holiday by a president who, if you looked at his life, 
had many reasons to object to giving thanks. What was his life like? When he was seven years of age, his family was forced out of their home and he went to work. Seven years of age, he's experiencing homelessness. When he was nine, his mother died. He lost his job as a store clerk when he was 20. He wanted to go to law school, that was his dream, but he didn't have the education, he didn't have the background, and another door was closed, and another dream was crushed. At the age of 23, he went into debt to be a partner in a small store. Three years later, the business partner died, and the resulting debt took years to repay. Pay. So he's dealing with financial destruction. When he was 28, I like this, this is, this is the ultimate feeling of being a loser. When he was 28, after courting a woman for four years, so they're dating for four years, he asked her to marry him, and she turned him down. Ladies, if you're going to turn someone down, you don't wait for four years. At age 37, on his third try, he was elected to Congress, but then was failed to be reelected. It wasn't very popular. His son died at four years of age. When this man was 45, he ran for Senate and lost. At 47, he ran for the vice presidency and lost. But at age 51, he was elected president of the United States. This man, of course, was Abraham Lincoln, a man who faced great adversity and great discouragement, a man who had every reason to say, I will not give thanks. Yet in the midst of a bloody civil war in 1863, when he was extremely unpopular. His approval ratings were, would have been low. He established the annual celebration of Thanksgiving that we celebrate today. He could have said he experienced too much death and suffering. He could have objected, but rather he saw God as the solution in the midst of that bloody civil war and not the problem. And this is part of his proclamation of 1863. He said, it has seemed to me fit and proper that the gifts of God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. And I think he meant both North and South. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And that was as the bloody civil war raged. What is it that, what is it that the pilgrims and Abraham Lincoln and our psalmist understood how is it that in the face of great struggles they gave thanks to God? What did they know that allowed them to look past what they did not have and all the evils in the world, the suffering, the pain, and still give thanks? The answer, I believe, is found in the repeated response of Psalm 136. Instead of looking at what we do not have or the things that we need to be delivered of, let us as a people look at the one who has given us all things and has delivered us from our most dreaded enemies. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus, and you see his faithful love enduring forever. The truth to give thanks for in Psalm 36 or 136 is his faithful love, his chesed, endures forever. The cross is the ultimate emblem of his faithful love. He demonstrated his love by entering into our pain and suffering and paying the price to deliver us from our enemies of sin, death, and Satan. It took the cross, that great emblem of his faith, his faithfulness, of his devotion to us, of his faithful love. He is not the problem. He is the solution to a world that is lost and in pain. He is the hope in the darkness. He is the light in the darkness that people need to see. His faithful love endures forever, and thus so should our thanks and our praise. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice always. Always rejoice? Yeah, it's a joy in salvation that's there no matter what's going on. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Be dependent upon him. Know where the power is at. Give thanks in all circumstances. Even 2020? Even in COVID-19 year? Yeah. For this is God's will for you. Important words at the end. In Christ Jesus. In Jesus, we have everything. Objection number one, look at what I don't have, is solved with a Christ-like attitude when I can be thankful for what someone else does have. Objection number two, 
though there is too much evil and suffering, yes, there is. There is also the cross. Objection number two is solved by Christ himself as he confronts and defeats our problem. He is the solution. And he's the solution for you today as well. I'm going to take a, a moment of, of, of silent prayer because usually what I would do right now is something where we do something more publicly, but I'm very conscious of the coronavirus and, and how we do things. So right where you're at uh, in our socially distanced auditorium, uh, just take a moment silently. Let's focus. Let's take a minute and focus on Christ, on the cross and what he's accomplished, and let's thank him. Let's thank him as a people. Silently, right where you're at, in your heart right now. Father, the thanks that we're giving now silently to you as a people, I pray that it would be sincere and that we realize that you really have given us everything. We are thankful for the cross. We realize that you are the solution. You are not the problem. Forgive us, Father, when sometimes we see you as the problem. When in our human frailty and our human limitations, we lash out at you in anger. Help us to see that you are our friend. You are the benevolent one who has given us all things. And let us embrace you afresh this week as we give thanks when it comes to Thursday, whether we're more alone than we would like to be or not. Let us give thanks because we are never truly alone. Your faithful love is present and your faithful love endures forever. And we thank you for that. Let us be a thankful people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I close, and I know we're online too, so I do this for the benefit of a couple of things here. I often go through a short gospel message. I'm, I'm going to do it again. If you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus, that's where it needs to be. God created you to be in a relationship with him. Isn't that good news? Your creator loves you. He wants to be with you. He wants to be near you. He wants to be inside of you through the Holy Spirit's indwelling. He wants a close, intimate relation. He loves you so much because you're created in his image. But we have a problem, and he has a problem. We have a sin problem, and our sin separates us from a holy God that has nothing to do with sin. So we're here, his, he, he loves you desperately, and yet because of the sin that we all have, we're all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's like, I, I, I can't be in relationship with one who has embraced sin. Sin can't be removed, Scripture tells us, by human effort, by what we've done, because, you know, we can't be good enough, we fall short, it tells us. We needed a sacrifice, someone who in our place would pay the penalty so that we could be in relationship. Paying the price for our sin, Jesus died on that cross. And he rose again victoriously that everyone who puts their faith and their trust in his work on the cross has eternal life. Receive, if you receive the gift of salvation, it's, a new, it's something he offers you. So I have this for you. I went to the cross for you. I want to be with you. Would you take this? You need to, you need to apply it to yourself. You, you, you need to, to respond in faith to this. And if you do, we can be in relationship again. Please do. And it involves life, a meaningful, purposeful life with your creator that begins now and lasts forever.
you have not yet personally invited Christ into your life, I'm going to say a prayer, as I always do in closing. I invite you to just pray silently in your heart, online or here. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place for my sin. Thank you for shedding your precious blood for me. I personally apply this. I receive your work on the cross for me. I receive this gift of eternal life. I receive you as my Savior and a relationship with you. And I will follow you as my Lord. I trust you that today I am your child. I will always be your child. You will indwell me with the Holy Spirit. And we will be in a relationship forever. Thank you. Please take my life and use it for your glory. I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'm going to close us, and you can stand with me in closing if you are able. And as I do that, um, right after the service, we have a Many of you, by the way, we had, we had these boxes come in, and thank you so much for bringing in the uh, in boxes. And we just want to pray over those boxes, the, the Samaritan's Purse boxes. So I'm going to do that in a couple minutes right after I get done here. But you can join me back there for that if, if you so desire. Uh, Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters and everyone here. We do want to be a thankful people. It's hard, Lord. The world is hard. It's not a kind place. We feel ripped off. We feel cheated in so many ways. But we trust you. Whether we're persecuted and whether 2021 is better than 2020, and boy, do we want it to be. We look to you and we thank you for a faithful love that endures forever. And through faith in your son Jesus, we will be with you for an eternity. And 2020, a million years from now, will seem like a distant fog that never even happened. Thank you that your faithful love endures forever. Let us remember that this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming today. Let's go in peace and say a prayer over the boxes.